Well, thank you. Uh, thank you for having me. It's a pleasure to be here and uh, to introduce a little bit of social science in our hard science. As you uh, will hear, hopefully, and you get from my talk, I really believe that we have to move uh, uh, forward and uh, uh, forget about boundaries between different disciplines, because as several of the speakers have outlined earlier on, the way to move forward as far as scientific is disciplines are concerned are much more about how we can solve a problem than then rather who can solve it. That is like teamwork more than anything else. And to illustrate that point of view, I just put not because I, I wanted to show you all my multiple affiliations, but I put you uh, the number of centers I'm, I'm part of at the University of Wisconsin-Madison. University of Wisconsin-Madison, a little bit uh, as uh, we were talking about this morning with uh, BioEsks, is really trying to foster that idea that interdisciplinarity nowadays will be key in to solving most uh, problems that we are facing as society. And uh, for example, you see that uh, uh, my department here, the Department of Life Science Communication, is in the College of Agriculture of Life Sciences, supposed to work with all the departments that actually are producing uh, 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 science that's relevant for Wisconsin and beyond, and is integrating you know, like science and social science to respond to the mission of the college. The whole Center for Science and Technology Studies was uh, created with uh, funding from the Holtz uh, uh, family. The idea to bring around the table anybody that's interested in using science and technology to solve the problems that society face, independently of their, their discipline. So really that idea that we have to answer different key questions by uh, bringing expertise around the table. So again, Carla came up with a very uh, thoughtful uh, question and title for my talk, uh, which I'm usually not used to address this way. I'm interested really in the interaction between science, media, and society, and mainly why do people uh, form uh, specific attitudes toward complex uh, controversial scientific issues, mainly in the life sciences. And uh, the question was like, who needs to know about this type of, of, uh, of research? And the one that we're addressing here, biotechnology, stem cell research, and nanotechnology happen to be be the core key of what I'm studying, mainly because I was trained as a biologist in a former life. Um, so it made me ponder, OK, so what do those things have to in common? And when we think in terms of like who should know about them or what should we tell people about them, can we actually extract from all those issues something that make them comparable? And here, uh, insights from sociology of science are quite useful. We can think about these disciplines to some extent, nanotechnology, biomedical sciences, stem cell research, biotech, etc., as what we call post-normal science. The, 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 the era of normal science is has been, as my teenager boy would say. And it's actually now we need to think in terms of like that other type of science, as, uh, as uh, uh, Funtowicz and Ravitz uh, pointed out, sociologists of science, that goes beyond what we used to think about, because they integrate a lot of aspects that go beyond science itself. So if you think of a continuum here of uh, applied science uh, toward other type of post-normal science, the more you go into the uncertain way, we don't know what this science is going to produce. We don't know it's gonna, how this science is going to be accepted in society. How is it going to be regulated? Who's going to have something at the table to say about how we should move forward? And if you look at the decisions that are at stake uh, whenever some kind of policy they should make in relation to those science, you can see that uh, post-normal science really integrates those type of science we're talking about, such as nanotechnology, uh, biotechnology, or STEM research, and the like. Why? Because they all have at stake some kind of policy decision. That means that not only the scientists that we used to call the hard scientists will have uh, something to, to bring, but also others, uh, because at the end of the day, you know, this is taxpayer money that we're using to inform this type of research. So let's, uh, let's step back then and say there's post-normal science. What do they have in common? So those issues that have not only technical uh, dimensions, but also social, legal, 
ethical dimensions and the notion of expertise and who will have to know about these things suddenly becomes much more complicated. And I think Susan uh, uh, illustrated that this morning when she was uh, talking about how suddenly talking about you know uh, producing uh, pharmaceuticals and all the potential dimensions that are linked to that potentially clear-cut goal suddenly goes uh, become very complicated and transcend that normal scientific enterprise uh, 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 context that we were used to talk about. And as you're going to see, uh, since it leads to the, uh, uh, my, uh, my talk take home measure, to the type of educational uh, uh, context we give to our students when we teach them about science. And this is, I think, the core of what we think in terms of uh, the future of science, the future of women in science and such. Maybe we should rethink what science is. So the shared features of those type of, uh, of, uh, of issues is number one, they are value-based dimensions. You think of nanotech, you think of biotech, you think of stem cell research, all of you can think of some type of debate that was uh, you know, like uh, on the public realm related to those issues. And the proposition that was uh, you know, like put on the table in California very recently to try to see if uh, genetic engineered food should be labeled. Um, some one engineer, you know, uh, that that uh, is still, you know, dealing with a lot of uh, controversies as far as regulation uh, by the FDA, etc., etc., and that. Uh, Obviously, and hopefully Vicky will talk about that. And you know, there's still the, the lack of regulation related to nanotoxicity. That's also a big, big dimension related to nanotechnology and uh, and, and, uh, and scientific knowledge that it's entail. This value system that are related to those issues mean that there are competitive interests at agenda. And Susan point out the countries that produce the trees from which the pharmaceutical come, uh, you know, versus the big pharmaceutical company that make the money. The, the biomedical researchers that start a startup company versus, uh, you know, the activists that think there's a right to life that should, at conception, that should be preserved, et cetera, et cetera, et cetera likely to be intensely debated in the public sphere and hence make things complicated and very different from one country to the other. So we talk about science as a global enterprise and I challenge that with my post-normal science approach in the context that suddenly if you're in France, genetic engineering has vastly different type of consequences than if you are in the United States, for example. So very complex social, cultural and political aspects that have to be talked about. So women in post-normal science then versus women in science comes a very different uh, uh, type of, uh, of these to attack uh, from uh, educational and knowledge sharing type of, of, uh, of approach because of that whole idea that that post-normal science has an increasingly, and we talked about that uh, uh, at various uh, times uh, this morning, potential for polarization. That means that you will have people that will be fight, fighting over that. Are we preparing uh, those next generation of scientists to will deal with that? I'm not so sure we are, and hopefully, you know, with people like all of you extensively interested in making the science the best for tomorrow, we can uh, reach uh, some type of agreement. So teaching science in a climate of controversy, a view from the American scientific affiliation, to some extent is the reality of what uh, post-normal science is and that, that uh, we need to think about. So that was my first thought about, okay, who should, should know about that stuff? Hmm, all right, so all post-normal scientific dimensions, complicated, that are not just scientific, that have all those type of dimensions that should be put on the table. So from this perspective then, it seems that the rea reaction would be that uh, um, everybody should know. Everybody has something to do with it. It goes way beyond the lab, it goes way beyond the university, it goes way uh, beyond just those who will have a say in the policy making process. And so from a democratic point of view and from democratic theory, this makes sense. Oh yes, everybody should know. We all like citizens and everybody should have at least the potential to react to things that, you know, their money and their, their uh, will fund to some extent. Practical realities 
is that possible? Can we actually have enough outreach activities? Can we open enough science centers? Can we actually encourage enough uh, high school, you know, science to be taken into account for to make this uh, possible? And also, when you think in terms of changing levels of knowledge, for whatever reason, this is extremely expensive and extremely complicated. Um, you wouldn't be surprised to know that most people that go to science centers to learn about new science, for example, are already the educated ones. So the people that send their kids to a science center are the ones who already know about science. And you will be surprised either to know that when you think of the educational system, we spend maybe 12 hours, 12 years, actually, we do spend 12 years of our, our childhood in uh, high school, four plus six if we go for PhD, uh, you know, in college, but they say 40 years, 50 years of our life are not spent in an educational system. This is where people should know about you know, post-normal science. This is where we should tell them about it because change appears very fast. And science is really evolving so fast that whatever we actually learn in a formal educational system gets lost very quickly unless it's your own field. I mean, I, was tr I got a master's in biotechnology genetics a long time ago. And uh, I actually mm, surpri was surprised, not really surprised, uh, not pleasantly surprised, let's say, to see my kids in ninth grade in high school to actually learn what I was learning as a master's student, right? So the question is, do they need to know that? Do they need to know, you know, the structure of DNA, R A, RNA when they are in ninth grade in high school? That's another question we can debate later on. The science is evolving, so what should people know in this context? And can we make sure that they always are, to some extent, the informed citizens that we would like them to be? So I think what should people know? Like, it, uh, you know, normatively, we would think they should know enough to be able to understand what's going on in a society where science changed very fast. But better questions to ask then is, where can they know? Where can they learn about it in that of that past uh, normal science? And what do they do with that knowledge? Is it actually something that we really strive to do? Do they really need to increase knowledge because that's our normative goal? So this is something that I talked recently about with uh, the National Science, uh, uh, National Academies of Science, that reality is that actually people know or find out about science in the new uh, media environment. And this is the reality of, uh, of today's world. Uh, uh, I told you the educational system is way uh, uh, beyond most people's life. And so they may go to science media sites. They search actually online with Google being uh, the, the, the most uh, favorite stuff for anybody that wants to know about anything. Even everybody in this room, I bet that you all go to Google at some point to find out about something. Video sharing sites, blogs, and other web uh, point two, uh, uh, tools. Uh, reaction people tell me, well, yeah, but not for science. This is not something that happened. We do that you know, when we want to find out uh, you know, what's uh, the weather in uh, the city we're going to visit next week. However, the reality is very different. And a few important statistics should be kept in mind. Four in five Americans do use regularly the internet. And the most popular uh, online activity is actually using those search engines to find information. As recently as uh, 2007, actually, a study showed that 60% uh, of Americans had uh, Google gone online to find uh, something related to a scientific topic. So this is really the first stop of where people go. And uh, as you can see here on a typical day, uh, last uh, uh, in February, 60% of Americans had used a search engine to find information, send or read email, use a social networking site. Get news, get the fourth, uh, the fourth uh, uh, um, rank here. Why am I saying that? Because we knew that that's what, where people would learn about science in general, is that through the news. That was regularly the way it was. But this has changed. They actually may have find out this information through their social network or with a, a um, uh, a search engine. YouTube is not anymore something that only teenagers do. As a matter of fact, 71% of online adults use uh, things like YouTube. And you'll be surprised, and that could be another talk, at the content of scientific-related uh, issues, post-normal issues that you can find on YouTube. 
and the, the, the extremely interested, uh, interesting um, type of content that's there. As an illustration of nanotechnology related material, uh, um, a, a video that was posted last year by a team of engineers, by students at Virginia Tech uh, uh, about nanoquadrators went viral and hit two million hits after like six months. And this is a pure engineer, you know, like type of, uh, of approach that was talking about something that's kind of complicated. So science can go viral, and people can find about it on this kind of side. This is kind of a good news, uh, like, uh, uh, the, the connectivity and the mobility. I mean, all of us here with our smartphones. Um, there has been an increase in the use of the news since people went uh, to uh, the cell phone platform and most recently the iReader and iPad and all those type of tablets. Hence, again, that idea that you know you find more and more uh, things that are interesting to science in those type of environment. All right, and so the question about where do people find out about science then? If we cannot really teach them about everything that's going on, uh, can we at least be sure that they find something that's interesting to them and policy making? And uh, a recent uh, uh, report by uh, the National Science Foundation, they do those biennial surveys, the science engineering indicators that look at different trends in science engineering, actually show that for specific scientific issues, uh, uh, most people will go to the internet to find out. And that's related to the search that I was telling you about, or maybe like specific uh, uh, blogs that they're interested about. So you would say, well, good news then. I guess good news if we want to have some society that's uh, you know, aware of what's going on in science. The bad news, though, is that this is, goes back to the woman in science issue and the idea to produce the best science for tomorrow is that not everybody has the same trends as far as trying to find information. And this was actually a, a study we did related to nanotechnology, more specifically, nano-related knowledge but we would have the same trends with biomedicine and, and biotechnology. So if you look at, actually, if you see that here, if you look at where people find out the most about that post-normal science stuff, among the whole population here, you can see that only 7% go online only. Online only means blogs, searching, something that has nothing to do with mainstream media, something where you cannot control the content. 34% have an online traditional mix. When I say traditional here, it's online newspapers or print newspapers. <coughs> it's uh, regular TV or online TV, okay? Traditional is like the new traditional. Uh, only newspapers online or not, 16%. Television online or not, 20%. And traditional media mix like the print, you still have uh, 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 23%. But if you look at the younger population here, the 18 to 30 to 4 year old here, they go, 40% of them go only to the online only. That means they don't open a newspaper, even online. They just go to blog, they're gonna search. These are the ones, you know, that are, we are concerned about as far as potentially reaching. Um, and obviously this trend uh, changes. Uh, the older you are, the more you tend to go more toward a traditional mix. I'm sure you're not surprised by this, uh, by this uh, answer that. Going back to training uh, the, the, the scientists of tomorrow, the post-normal scientists of tomorrow, by taking into account every potential creative, intellectually diverse, uh, and the interested type of individuals, which include women and men, all right? That means that we have to create already in our population some kind of like positive attitude towards those enterprise earlier on. So that means that we need to make sure that at least before, well, in college, you already have the positive attitude towards those fields. So this is where it gets a little bit troublesome because what we've seen here is that, so you see the age is moving towards only online, right? But we see that there's actually, and apologies for those, uh, those lines here that are pretty, pretty uh, light, but if you see here, that actually when you look at the online only type of, uh, of, um, of group, you have a clear divide as far as gender is concerned. Guys tend to go online more than women. Even if we know that most of the younger people go there for science. I'm talking about to find out about science. 
we mean that we may have again a reverse in our curve. If these say 18 years old are having so their attitude towards science, you know, earlier on impacted by what they find online, you may have a divide that's created between the woman and the man early on right now. So this is to some extent the good news, a lot of information is there. The bad news that we're recreating artificially, some kind of gender divide that will you know, be uh, seen as a consequence once they go to college. And so food for thought here that I wanted to put on the table. So all right, so they can find out a lot of stuff. There's a lot of stuff there. And if you're interested, we have uh, 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 written papers on content analysis of what they find. So that goes to normal science, but that's more like computer intelligence and stuff would be another talk. But let's, let's assume they find, they, they acquire knowledge. Well, I said everybody should know. But what do they do with that knowledge? And here you have a, a lot of insight from psychological research that is useful to take into account to answer this question. Number one, I like the take home message of uh, my risk communication class to some extent, where all the students come and they're eager to say, how can we teach people right what the right way to, have to, to think about the risk so they have the right risk perception? And like, unfortunately, if that was so easy, we would have like, you know, like done that for a long time. And as a matter of fact, knowledge is not the main predictor of attitude toward controversial scientific topic. At best, it's a very weak predictor. So the more you know about an issue, doesn't mean that the more you support that issue. The more you know about stem cell research, doesn't mean that the more you support stem cell research. The more you understand the science behind bio nanotechnology, doesn't mean the more. And I know every, all of you, and this is called the science, uh, the deficit model. In, uh, uh, in my field is that, you know, it's not a knowledge deficit. It's not that you can cram knowledge in people's head and they're going to change their view. We are all complicated human beings to some extent. We're not so complicated, but quite complicated. And if it was just that relationship, wow, we wouldn't have that issue. We would have a lot of women in science. We would have a lot of different things that would be different. Knowledge is only one piece of the puzzle. So what are the other pieces of the puzzle? Audience are using information and heuristic to make sense of those complex issues. And lay audience have very little factual knowledge about science, both genders. 51% know how long it takes for the Earth to go around the sun. 38% understand the logic of an experiment. 22% understand the concept of a scientific study. And I'm talking about uh, the average American across ages You know that has way beyond that a dedication uh, system. Oops, come on. And I'm going to switch that. But uh, so basically, what we call this in uh, in uh, in science communication, the cognitive miser model. Imagine if you have to think about everything all the time. How tired that would be. I go. I look at uh, outside. I see a blue sky. You know, blue sky, sun. Sun, not so cold, not so cold. Maybe I shouldn't wear my hat. Unless it's in Wisconsin, then it doesn't work. All right? So this is called a mental shortcut. We have your risk we rely on to make sense of the world around us. Because if not, it would be really too complicated. And only under certain conditions, such as being in a classroom, being forced to think by the professor, and that's not even true all the time, you know, we will stop and think thoroughly about something. So what do we do? We actually use things that are done by the social norms. For example, women that may think, oh, it's not the norm to actually go to grad school because I have kids and I may not have time. This is a normative view that has nothing to do with knowledge. This is something that's related to a social norm that we have to change. Framing in the val uh, media and values. And I'm going to talk very briefly about those. Basically, you know, scientific information is complex. And what we do? is that most of the time, we're going to get cues from things around us. And these are just a few theories that exist in communication. One is the cultivation theory. And the National Academy has actually really bought that the idea and are, are using them to work with Hollywood. Popular culture gives us clue about to think about certain things. We think that the reality we see in popular entertainment, TV, and movies is actually the truth. Women in science, how many women in scientists have you seen in movies? Can you remember any? 
Like everybody's blanking. What? There was. What? But why look at all the scientific movies, science fiction movies, for example. A recent one would be Thor, you know, where you had Natalie Portman, who was the. the, the Avatar. 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 Yes. So Natalie Portman, you know, was supposed to be a nurse in that movie originally. So the National Academies actually worked with Hollywood and convinced the producers to actually change the role and make her a physicist. To have actually those that you can be beautiful, pretty, and whatever, and be a physicist that has nothing to do with anything. This is what we call the cultivation idea. That the idea that, you know, like what's very popular culture will have a, an impact on other things. Phrase is something that we look at a lot, a lot, is the way media give a shortcut to think about issues. And in this case, we're talking about nanotechnology, unseen hazards versus this could change everything. You just have one headline there, you know, that gives you a clue on how to interpret the rest of the information that's put in the article. So and I have a lot of examples about this kind, but this is something that uh, we haven't invented, by the way. Those were economists, I'm sure you're aware of uh, Kahneman and Zwerky, actually that was not, uh, he was in, a, uh, gave them the Nobel Prize at the end, that the idea that the perception of something complicated is reference dependent. So that means that complex scientific issue, the post-normal science issue, you know, cannot be understood in isolation. You need to use mental shortcuts to make sense of them. And that they call it the ambiguous 13. If I show you this here without any type of context, what do you see? But half of you see a B, half of them you see a 13. If I you give you a context, suddenly here it's clear your B versus here it's clear your 13. Well, that's what media gives people. They give them that, com that context to actually make sense of complicated information. You know, here, that lung damage linked nanoparticles in China makes it, oh, this is a bad stuff. Breast sensors identify signs of lung cancer, oh, this is a good stuff. The same technology, and both are not incorrect, those are factual facts that are framed very differently. And we see these all the time, you know, the idea that you need to use some kind of like metaphor to make scientific information complex for certain people. These are two very different things. This is a journalistic attempt to make something, you know, manageable by an audience. This is actually a campaign used by Greenpeace to uh, communicate about uh, 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 genetic engineering. Very successful uh, type of approach by connecting something that people can relate to, Frankenstein, Franklin food, mental shortcut, bad stuff. They were extremely successful by using this type of frame to communicate about an issue. And the headlines can do the same. Look, at here you have the same image with cloning. Will there ever be another you or understanding cloning? Will be there to be another you is actually suddenly puts you in a mental framework to analyze the rest. And this is how populations and the audience make sense of scientific information. I thought that was really funny because it's the stereotypical portrayal of scientists, by the way. Uh, when you ask a kid, draw me a scientist, and we do that in schools, they always will draw someone with a beard and glasses. Usually they put a white lab to a white coat. So you have the, the here that was about cloning, great explorations, versus here, if you want people to feel fuzzy and emotional, just shoot them cute babies, and you will be suddenly trigger a lot of psychological responses. Anyway, I just want to finish with uh, two points. First of all, that idea that the literacy model, the knowledge about something, won't change people's attitude. And as a matter of fact, in nanotechnology, this is non-significant in all our models. Controlling for age, education, gender, may be more supportive usually. Uh, knowledge doesn't stay significant in the model. But what stays significant, actually, is the optimistic interpretation of the benefits a, a certain technology can bring to people. So it's all about the framing. So we need to use this when we communicate to the future woman that will work in post-normal science. We need to actually use those techniques to be able to uh, explain that a given frame that may mean something different to different people can be used to communicate about something. And I just would like to... Uh,
that's my timer telling me that I'm done. I just would like to uh, show you just two things to illustrate that. Here we had a, 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 the average uh, support for nano funding. Uh, uh, here, and we break down on different type of groups. We were trying to look at what kind of filters people use to make sense of knowledge. Why did knowledge even work? Why couldn't actually just knowledge explain uh, attitude? And here we had uh, two different groups, one that were low in strong religious belief and high in strong religious belief. And you can see here that among the higher knowledge people, they were more supportive. But among the highly religious one, that made was down. So like knowledge didn't make the difference among people get strongly held values. You can attempt as much as you want to change knowledge about a specific issue, but if people have strongly held values, they're gonna interpret that knowledge through what we call perceptual filter. And this uh, holds true also for support for a, a human embryonic stem cell and also for nanotech. So those mental frameworks matter, and we used to give to, to, to take them into account when we communicate. And uh, we talk a lot about that in a book we, we uh, uh, had recently. But what I would like to stop uh, by saying is that this is a, a new area for people like me, because we have to use a lot of computer science to do this kind of stuff, because there's so much information in new media environment that it's really hard to control what people are going to find. So we need to also use the tools of search optimization, of linking, uh, you know, like the web says a certain way to make people get the information that we want them to get. And last but not least, for food for thought, who is responsible for that communication overall? Who should have, is it the national academies? Is it the foundations? Who should have a role to making sure that the frames are adequately used? And should we focus on teaching science and society? In that post-normal world, should we stop teaching our students? You know, dehumanize, as we were talking about before. Can we bring humanity back in the classroom? Telling them it's about values. People will disagree. I'm telling you about, you know, biomedical research in this classroom. You need to know that some people disagree. It's also about society. It has implications. So what do we mean by knowledge, basically? Can we go and be beyond just scientific facts? Thank you, and sorry for rushing at the end. <laughs> Very interesting to me. I never knew I was doing both normal science. <laughs> I like that. They usually can scientists listen when I tell them that. <laughs> because, you know, all these questions that you brought up, the ethical, the legal, et cetera, are very much And, and the question is, should we teach that? Like, so I'm in the College of Agricultural Life Science. I'm a strong advocate of teaching around issues and not teaching around disciplines. And with some of my colleagues, we try to develop classes that integrate, for example, food safety. So we, my colleague, bacteriologist, talks about you know, that, that aspect. I talk about risk perception. The compu com consumer science professor talks about what happens in supermarkets and stuff. In that overview, of what happens around an issue do versus, oh, take that class in science, take that have, class uh, there, and, and, and the students don't really make those connections. And if you want to create, you know, like, okay, uh, have scientists just, uh, that are really the scientists of tomorrow, gallery? basically we need to invent that future, right? So we need to make an educational system responsive, and I'm glad that you are, you know, you are aware of that type of thing, because I'm sure when you interact with <laughs> what students, you make that, you know, important, right? I was struck by the gender difference in uh, who's reading what. Um, and if you believe, uh, if your studies, if your studies have shown that most of the stuff on online only is not necessarily correct, that means a lot of men are, or males are <laughs> no. misappropriately. Actually, our studies haven't shown that the most of the stuff online is not correct. Yeah. Science. Well, actually, you know, it's interesting that you say that because. The, and we're doing more complicated studies now to go, you know, like more in detail. But uh, the, the, the idea that, that we can know for sure what each individual encounter is actually like, you know, rather complicated to measure. So like we try to match, like in what we did that study, we match 
Nielsen data, which actually tracks individual people, and the word they look for, the keywords they look, and then the likelihood they have to, to find go online or not. So like matching, the, that's big data. I was so happy to say there was a new big data thing. I'm gonna, so like, how do you analyze this stuff? And we kind of like inventing ourselves in this world of big data. So we, I would tell you that right now we don't have in, enough empirical evidence to say. Most of those people that are only or in the online environment are exposed to wrong science because we don't know. Well, I would say medicine that's very, that's pretty clear because uh, I know in cancer, if you do random searches for various cancers, breast cancer for instance, you're likely to find a lot of stuff that's very misleading because of people's perceptions about you know, you know, why cancer should be treated because we can't treat it. Right. On the other hand, you know, there's research in, uh, in uh, health communication that shows that there's also a change in the way uh, uh, patients train themselves. And they end up being much more knowledgeable than they used to because they're going to make the effort sometimes to go back to the original scientific study, which we thought was unheard of before. So it's that, you know, so it's like, it's like it's still, we're still like wondering. So cost benefits, it's true, there's a lot of bad stuff. There's also good stuff. And that's why I'm an advocate on open source. Let's make as much as the good stuff available to everybody. So you increase the likelihood. Because to be honest, with all the, you know, like the, the closed publications, scientific publication, that means that a lot of people cannot access the good stuff. Because it's just reserved for the people that have the training. Well, in that world of online access, shouldn't that good stuff also be available? To account to that. So it's a, all those are topical questions that we're struggling to answer right now. Yes. So Dominic, I'm, I'm trying to make sense, and I often ask uh, specialists in communication this question of this knowledge deficit. So on one hand, the data says people don't care about information. But on the other hand, if you look at cigarette smoking or the ozone hole, you know, there was sort of a tipping point in both public opinion and regulatory policy that I don't think would have happened without trusted data that sort of built up over years. And I might argue in climate change, we're going through that tipping point. Now. So I, I'm trying to reconcile if, if knowledge, information, and science doesn't matter in public opinion, how do you make sense of some of these historical situations where, you know, in the 70s, it was all confused to nobody really knew cigarettes were going to cause cancer, and then all of a sudden, I think if you ask people, they would all agree there's a causation. So how do you explain how those transitions happen? Well, that's a good question. And, uh, and you know, like, and, uh, and uh, he said that the that idea that for in 30 minutes I need to convince you of things that they took over four years to pass through this. But so, like, I would say, I didn't say knowledge does not matter. I said, in most cases, the relationship between knowledge and attitude is not significant. It varies issues by issue. But I would address, like, the points that you just said. Number one, uh, smoking, the only way you actually change attitude towards smoking, and this is like the whole, you know, like social market thing, I teach social, like how do you change people's attitude to social issues? It changed because you had the regulation that made it illegal. It made it illegal to uh, smoke inside. And you know what changed? The social norm around smoking. In this country, you are looked at some kind of like weirdo if you smoke. You know, it's like not socially acceptable anymore to smoke in this country, and that, as a matter of fact, there's some research that shows that the social normative aspect is the best predictor of why people wouldn't smoke. People know that smoking is dangerous. That's not what they make them change. Number two, look at the truth campaign. The most effective campaign against smoking was actually used by, you know, like money used to, from a settlement against the tobacco company. They use that money, and they actually found the most, actually, best design campaign against smoking. For teenagers, to prevent teenagers to start, you know what they did? They didn't tell the teenagers it's dangerous to smoke. They told them, those companies, they try to trick you. You need to know the truth. They're making big money out of you. They like dare to get you. And teenagers don't like to be manipulated, right? So it's basically that idea is that we tell those teenagers that those, those bad people there. And that was very effective. So I would argue that for smoking, the one that the things that have made the difference is not really the realization that it was dangerous. Climate change is a great example. You know why people are beginning to believe 
in uh, human activity and climate change in this country? Because of the drought, because of the climate, because of what, what has happened here. Climate change in this country has become a political issue, you know, in a way that it hasn't been, let's say, in, in France. So you actually have a political divide as far as like, you know, like the, 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 the climate change issue and believing in human activity. So recent research in nature climate uh, research actually showed that if you talk about the health consequences of climate change, that makes people change their view. If you use as a frame, you know what? The kids of your kids, they may have malaria. Because you know where you live now, you're gonna have mosquitoes that carry malaria than here. People respond to that frame. Versus if you use the frame of environmental disaster, well, most people don't regret. Because it's not in their worldview. It goes back to those mental shortcuts. So I should correct myself. I should not have a blank statement about science. Knowledge doesn't matter. It matters sometimes, but it definitely doesn't matter as most of us in science we used to think. You know, I, why I came from that perspective and I went back to grad school because I was not successful in my attempts when I was a work for Accenture in health and environment and we couldn't change people's attitudes. I was like, this is complicated. So you have to take it case by case and do your homework. Thank you.